Hello to everyone watching. My name is Laura and this is another expert talk with our class. Uh, we've already covered quite a few topics here. Uh, we've spoken about customer care, communication, leadership, revenue management and aviation landscape as a whole. But there's one thing that we did not look into yet in much more detail and that is airports. And when we think about airports, we usually picture this building where we go to start our journey or maybe greet someone who's coming back. But rarely do we think about what's happening behind the scenes there, you know, what allows the smooth process of the passenger flow? How is it managed and so on? So I have someone today with me who can answer these questions and that is our class lecturer, instructor, Gordon Griffith. So Gordon, I very much appreciate you taking your time to sit down with me. You're welcome, and I'm looking forward to uh, my input, and hopefully uh, people will find it of interesting and, and maybe uh, sort of expose more about airports for them to understand. Absolutely. So as always in these talks, we're going to have a conversation about Gordon's past experiences, teaching, and of course his course at our class. So Gordon, if you're ready, um, I'd just like to jump in straight in. Um, and just ask you about your start in the aviation industry. Can you just tell us how you got there? Yeah, well, I guess um, in all honesty, it was, it was more or less by accident in a way. There was a job that became available at the airport uh, that uh, was close by to where I lived. I, I, um, I was down at my uh, aunt and uncle's house in a place called Luton and uh, for those who know the UK industry, Luton Airport is now a quite considerable size airport. And they were looking for baggage loaders. So it was a seasonal job, which was not uncommon for uh, that time of year. And I applied and then joined as a baggage loader. Um, and really after a very short while, it became a place where you wanted to work, the great camaraderie amongst all your colleagues, salary was good you know you could actually earn quite considerable money through doing overtime and such but it was an opportunity and then from there i soon realized that aviation was what i wanted to remain in as such and then from there i set forward a sort of a, a career path from what i could see was the way forward in terms of escalating my uh, roles through airports that ultimately saw me you know reach uh, the position of managing director at airports and operations director and uh, customer services director so i feel as though i've got a good solid background and understanding of those people who are on the ground and, and what they experience and yeah. what they're exposed to so that's and the way my my uh, career has gone so far i see and i'm guessing there was never a time where you in a way regretted your decision or maybe your like chosen career path no, not at all. No, it was something which I think a lot of people will say once, you know, once aviation is in your blood, then, you know, it stays with you. And many a time I've seen people say, right, I've, I'm, I've had enough of this and I'm going and they go and sure enough, they come back. Uh, it didn't really, that never really uh, was in my mind. I, I saw a great opportunity, a great career uh, opportunity for me and both uh, that was achieved in the UK and overseas, quite a considerable period of time overseas. And I think ultimately it led to me at the end of my sort of managerial career, moving into the, the sort of lecturing side and being able to share that experience with, with uh, participants from all over the world in terms of how airports operate um, with a really a, a good understanding. You know, I'm not sort of talking about theoretical I'm talking about realistic, what actually happens and how it is. And, and I think that's what gives me that, uh, that benefit that, and, and I can engage with people uh, through that. I see. And you've already mentioned different positions that you've been part of, uh, but is there anything that very much stands out for you in your mind, like something that you're very fond of maybe? First of all, I always worked on the basis, and, and this is sounds a bit of a cliche, but uh, if you enjoy your work, you, you you don't really work. And and that's the way I've always seen work. I've never, I've never had a day, I have to say, I've never had a day where I said, well, I don't want to go into work today. You know, I've never experienced that. And we're talking over, you know, 40 odd years of, uh, of time 
time served as such. But in terms of my career path, um, I wish perhaps I had done more on my um, educational side before I came into uh, aviation. And I'm sure that would have helped me. So I sort of did it in reverse. I then went back to college whilst I was still working and working my way through uh, my sort of managerial role. And, and at the same time with a young family, uh, it's not the way to do it really. You know, you, 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 you've got so much pressure with work and then you got try to do coursework and then throw in a young family. It's not the ideal time. You have to mm. do it beforehand. So if anything, I would have corrected that, but you know, in hindsight, that's, that's a great thing. And then as my career moved on, it, it then became apparent that I had good periods of time served in positions, which permitted me to apply for the next position, or it gave me the credibility. And as a result of that, from my sort of days at uh, Luton um, and my managerial, and then an opportunity came up to move to another airport in a sort of directorship role uh, that so the opportunity came there then that opened the opportunity to move to another position another airport and so forth and I you know developed my career along those paths now that is not always appropriate for everyone because not everybody can just get up and move but uh, for me it worked it worked well um, and then my time overseas uh, worked well because my family now were uh, the, the, my uh, two daughters were now in university and like so all the they don't want to hear from you they just want money uh, so th th they were fine and uh, and I was fine and my career was progressing and then to add to my airport manager's career I spent seven years with IATA based in Singapore as a head of uh, uh, airport development Asia Pacific and I think probably that role was probably my you know, my ultimate role in a sense. So, yeah, it was, it was a good period of time there, I have to say. And I can see like from what you're saying, you, you've you seen so many different kind of, uh, you know, backgrounds of work and, and you've worked in different places, different countries yeah. even. And then of course, you know, all the experience that you've gathered over the years, I guess it's kind of natural that you went into teaching because at some point you want to start sharing that experience yeah. with others you know and as you said sharing it in a realistic kind of way so obviously you've worked for ayata um and i just wanted to know how was your transition into teaching like was it something that you always wanted or did it also kind of just came across you well i always i, I think with aviation aviation is an industry that is people orientated so if you enjoy meeting with people, if you enjoy conversing with people, if you enjoy the the never two days of the same type of environment, then aviation is, is the industry to be in. And I enjoy meeting with people. I feel that I'm pretty uh, open, pretty, pretty easygoing, and, and I can converse at all levels. And when it sort of came to, to light was my time with IATA because the based in Singapore. Singapore is the regional office for Asia Pacific and also it's the regional training center. So it was part of the same building that I was in and I used to go and sit in on some of the, uh, the lectures or some of the teaching programs and it soon became apparent to me that this is something that I could easily do because what people were really doing was they were sharing their experiences and uh, you know, so what you have is sort of a two-sided sword as such. You have the the uh, experience in house. You've got your 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 uh, exposure in, in terms of that. But also, what you have got now is you're starting to understand the compliance side of it. So there's two sides to to running an airport: is the day-to-day -day issues, yeah, but there's also the compliance side. And as soon as I say, the penny sort of dropped that said, right, this is something you can do, and then. I approached IATA and started delivering some courses. And these are the courses at the Singapore office, primarily around uh, uh, airport operations. And there was two types of courses. There was basic airport operations and advanced airport operations. And I covered both. So I started off doing those. And then eventually IATA said, now could you do some overseas for us? You know, so I traveled. And then from there, it just, it just escalated. 
it just escalated. So my time in Singapore, I then took on a sort of a dual role. One is the subject matter expert for airports for IATA and, and delivering courses and also doing my airport development role as well. So when I left IATA, um, that background and experience now enabled me when I went to my time at, uh, in Abu Dhabi for three years. I started training there as well as doing my own job. And then when I left Abu Dhabi, I went straight into full-time training. Uh, and that's that's where it's come about really. And um, sadly, I mean, had COVID not come along, then things would have still been the same. I was um, two weeks at home, one week away. Two weeks at home, one week away. It worked out about 20 assignments a year globally. So it was great, great experience, great exposure. And actually great, uh, I have to say great participants, people who who really wanted to understand and learn. And I, my uh, my outlook was that I, if I'm there for a week, you have me for all of that time. And I used to ask mm -hmm. them to exploit it, exploit me, get what you can out of me because I'm quite willing to share it with you. And I guess then, you know, COVID came uh, and it kind of shut down the world. Um, and I think half of our lives have now been moved to a virtual space and same mm -hmm. goes for e-learning. And I guess, you know, we, you join our class and now you're a part of e-learning uh, aviation training. Um, I guess it must have been a little bit difficult for you, you know, as you just mentioned, you know, you were away and you liked, you know, being around people. Is yes. this transition something that was quite challenging then? Yeah, it was really because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, to a degree, like we're doing now, I'm, I'm talking to a screen and, and when I was doing the virtual classes, I mean, I was talking to a screen which had, you know, 10 or 12 participants and just mm -hmm. facial expressions, if you like. So you, you don't get that same connection. You don't get that same, if you like, touchy, touchy feel. You know, where you can, you know, if I'm talking to someone and trying to relay a subject heading to them, um, just by looking at them, I know whether they're taking it in or not. You, you become very adept at body language. You know when somebody is, uh, is, is sort of understanding what you're saying. And my role was always to make sure that for those who didn't quite understand, I wanted to give them the time to be able to focus in on that. So at the end of the day, because if they don't understand it, it just goes over your head. Yeah. It just, it just, you know, it's gone. So really it was, so in terms of virtual, it's very difficult to, I think at this one time to bring that closeness. But having said that, I also think that the generations now that are coming through the different uh, generations of, of uh, participants are quite used to virtual training, quite used to e-learning training. So to them, it probably is as good because in one sense, some of them don't know any different. There's an aspect of that where it's, and um, I think as time goes by, people will become more and more used to this sort of type of training. I'm sure that's what, and you know, in, when you think of all the aspects of it, rather than uh, maybe 10, 15 people flying from all over the world to meet at a certain venue, then an instructor flying in. This way, there is no travel as such, is there? Yeah. And there's no travel. So there's a there's a savings there from the one we say from an environmental aspect, but also from a cost saving as well. Absolutely. I guess that's exactly what IR class kind of suggests that, you know, you can learn anytime, anywhere at your own yeah. pace, which kind of gives you the freedom. Yes. And as you said, cost reduction is also a very important part of it. But as uh, as I understand what you're saying is that there is a future for aviation e-learning. Yes. No, most certainly. I think uh, that's the way forward. That's it, It's just, I think, to maybe to degree, it's maybe a sort of generation type. Uh, aspect it's and i just realized that uh, that's the way forward and that's the way it's going to be and 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 so you you know you need to work with it uh, and you you through uh, through more exposure you'll gain better skills and you'll be able to understand so i'm sure it would never be quite this it can't be the same as being in presence but it can nearly be there it can that's the only bit that's missing is the instruction not actually being there but if you can relate to to the uh, the individual themselves, and you can follow the theme of the uh, of the discussion, 
and the uh, information that's been uh, imparted, then I think it's, it's, it's the way forward. Good. Now, I want you to introduce your course. We're talking about aviation e-learning, so I guess it's the best time for you to kind of tell us what your course at our class is about, who is it aimed at, and what can people expect from it? Yeah. Well, you know, the I think your, your introduction highlighted this, that we're, we're looking at how airports operate now. So um, people just assume certain things with airports. Um, when you think about airports itself, there has to be a reason why you build the airport in the first place. Uh, we don't build airports because they're just nice to have. We build them for a purpose. We build them because there's a demand for an airport because they are very, very costly in terms of uh, construction. So this airport uh, course itself is broken down to uh, uh, 10 elements. And what I've tried to do is take a sort of a, an approach of, you have your um, beginning, which is the, the master planning, the development, the connectivity, how you get to the airport, where the airport is, perhaps the size of the airport, um, that we take into account the type of operations, runway lengths, all of those aspects. You know, we've got to we've got to first understand what um, what sort of airport do we want, what sort of passenger traffic are we going? Because if you say we're going to be a truly uh, international airport with you know long haul flights, or whatever, then the airport needs to reflect that in its infrastructure. Certain infrastructure needs to be in place for the aircraft to operate on. So it's it's starting from that basis. So once we've decided on the airport then, then we, we've sort of constructed this airport. Now we sort of take the view, okay, the passenger now is arriving at the front door. So he or she's got to get from where they are to the front door. So that's where we come into connectivity. So the road infrastructure, the rail, rail infrastructure, the bus, the taxi service, you have to be able to get to the airport. And I've seen instances overseas where the airports are ready, but the road infrastructure hasn't. And and that doesn't quite work, if, as you can appreciate. So we have to get the connectivity right. And then we have the passenger arriving at the front door, and then we go through a series of processes to the point where the passenger, he or she, then boards the aircraft. So I see airports as a transiting facility. We don't have people come into an airport and stay overnight and, well, might do if they're delayed, but they come in with a view that within a matter of hours, they've been processed through the system and they've been put onto an aircraft. And, and the same on the inbound. So passengers arriving at the airport arrive and go through a process where they then leave the airport. So we've got this arrival departure sort of uh, theme within the, the course itself. And it takes you through the steps. It takes you through the land side when you arrive at the airport. It takes you through the check-in area. It takes you through the immigration and security process. It takes you into the departure lounge and then takes you onto the aircraft. So that's the process. And that's known as curb to curb. Curb being the curb that when you arrive at the airport, the next curb is when you arrive at your destination airport. To Kurtka. And then similarly, on the arrival phase, you arrive at the airport on the aircraft, you deplane, you come into the uh, immigration hall, you go through the process, you go through the baggage reclaim, you then have then customs uh, to go through, and then you exit and then you leave the airport. Now, all of this process needs to be a constant sort of uh, movement, if you like, because we have to be releasing people as to allow people to come in. So we can't have nobody leaving and the departure lounge just filling up and filling up and filling up. Similarly, we can't have passengers arriving and the baggage claim uh, reclaim not working and bags piling up because the flights behind that won't be able to offload their luggage. So it's, it's a whole process and hopefully the course itself will, will give people who are either in managerial positions uh, a better understanding as to what uh, what opportunities there are within the airport itself. It will also help people who are maybe considering aviation as a career, particularly on the airport side. 
and it'll give them an insight into those to what to expect. And in between all that, there is all the uh, different aspects of what drives that. There's the uh, ICAO requirements in terms of compliance. There is the regulator for that particular country and, and their requirements. There is a need then for appropriate documentation to be in place. There is a need for uh, understanding audits and the purpose of audits and what you need to do to prepare for an audit. Then you have to put in uh, corrective actions in which to deal with the outcomes of audits and so forth. And then one of the biggest things is safety, health and safety. And everything we do in airports is geared to safety. And safety out of all aspects of running airport is the number one priority. So we've got to make sure our airport is safe, not only just for our passengers, but for our employees as well. So I like to think that the the the, uh, the course will take people through that and they can, they can see where they may wish to end up. They may see themselves in one department, but not quite sure how another department works. And this will give them an insight into that as well. So I think it's, it's, it's a good all round approach. And I, I guess it's going to be quite a lot of, to take in because um, a lot of information is going to be kind of presented. Yes. And I'm guessing, as you mentioned, you know, for anyone who might just be thinking about joining the aviation industry and can be just like a little glimpse of what they can expect of it, right? Yeah, yeah, most certainly. I think, uh, I think what people, uh, I mean, I, as I say, my job, my initial job in, in, into the career came purely, you know, by accident as such. But um, I like to think now that there's an opportunity when you come into airports that rather than drifting around various roles, you can see within your own mind, have a sort of structured approach as to what it is you want. So you have a step-by-step -step program. You know, and real, real good airports will have a, will have like a staff development program that actually takes them, that person from where they are and over a period of time, expose them to courses, expose them to certain roles and so forth and develop that individual so that you have career progression, but also what you actually are planning for at the airport is you have succession planning. So when someone leaves within the organization, you're not left with this, this massive uh, hole, if you like, you have someone who can step into it because if your uh, staff development program is right, you'll have been training people for that next move. And I think the other side of uh, aviation is people needing to realize that airports are 24 seven, 365 days a year. So if you're a person uh, who likes working Monday to Friday, nine to five, then that's fine. Uh, aviation is actually, you know, midnight to midnight, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So shift work is involved. And of shift work, I did 15 years of shift work and it's, there's some good bits with the shift, a shift pattern, such as your days off. But when you're sitting there at three o'clock in the morning, wondering why am I here? Why am I not in bed? Then it makes you realize. So shift work needs to be taken into account. It's, and most people have to go through a period of, of understanding that. Now that is not, um, it's, it's conducive if you're just an individual and you get no, but if you've got a family, and if you've got youngsters and you'd be doing night mm -hmm. shifts and you're coming home and so forth. So there's other, there's other added pressures that come to that. But I did my, I did my 15 years. So I think I, I can speak quite openly about shift work and the pressures and, um, you know, the aspects of you of trying to maintain a lifestyle around it as well. So let's kind of leave our viewers uh, an opportunity to explore your cars themselves. But I do want to talk to you about certain things regarding airports because i think it's quite interesting especially as you know many things about that mm. um because now airports as i mentioned at the beginning for some of us it's just like a building let's call it like that mm. you know it has a runway it has a terminal but to be fair the the airport function has changed over the years you know if we look back it used to be just a place for you to take off and now if we look at other airports around the world they're actual masterpiece you know they're 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 architectural arts 
Like yes. let's say Singapore airport, you know, it's it's considered to be one of the most beautiful airports in the world. So obviously, you know, with the function uh, functions changing within the airport, I guess the management of it also kind of it gets complicated. Yeah, well, no, you're right. I mean, funny enough, I've done uh, many sort of um, lectures and, and public speaking in my days with IATA, and I was I was asked once to do a sort of similar process of describing airports of where they've been and where they are now. And if you look at the airports of yesteryear, you know, many years ago, you know, basically, other than in the departure lounge, that you would find a restaurant, and that was it. That was that was the only uh, sort of commercial activities in in the uh, airport itself. And similarly, in the in the land side, there might be you know a few amenities, whatever, but very very sparse. It was it it was more a case of just getting people through a system, if you like. But then, with the advent of um, things like duty free, or, or um, and and airports being, if you like, pressurised to reduce their operating costs, airports then had to find another way of uh, of substituting that revenue, and hence why we now have such massive retail uh, within the departure within the airport it's such, itself now. The idea, of course, is not to have such the uh, same degree of uh, commercial activity on the land side, because what we want is people to, ar to arrive to check in and go through the system. We don't want them waiting on the land side. We want them in the departure lounge. We want them in the departure lounge. And that's where we have them as a captive audience. That's where we have them where, you know, in a true commercial uh, fashion, where we can exploit what we have so that we can look to get greater spend from passengers, some impulse spending. So what has happened now with airports is that they have now become these massive, in a way, they're a bit like a shopping mall yeah. to a degree. They're like a shopping mall with check-in desks. They're like a shopping mall with a runway. And the airport is, uh, and airports continue to grow where they are, um, developing their commercial activities. I mean, I'll give you an, an example in Abu Dhabi, when, which is just about to open this new terminal, when they put out their prospectus for the uh, commercial um, activities on the air side, it was oversubscribed by 200%. There are companies, massive, the world's biggest companies, see airports as a great opportunity in which to expose and to uh, make people aware of their products if you like so the the whole concept of airports now has changed it's also changed by the greater uh, need for ensuring customer satisfaction customer experience people having uh, going through your airport in a less stressful manner feeling that as part that the, the process through the term is part of their travel it's part of their travel. It's not something you have to fight your way through. It's so easy, it's simple. And in many surveys that have been done, passengers just want simplicity. They just want simple travel. When you arrive at the airport front, you get yourself a baggage trolley. You put your bags on, you look, you go inside the doors, you see a sign that takes you to the check-in desk. You go to the check-in desk now, you put your own bag on, you put your ticket on, your bag goes. You then go to the immigration desk, you put your passport in, you have uh, machine readable devices, reach the passport, through you go. You come to security. The security hasn't changed over the years, but what they have tried to do is make people more aware before they get to security. So they say, don't have these metal, you know, you've got your liquid and gels and so forth. So they get you ready, and then they put you through the, uh, the security search channel. Once you're through there, once you do, then we've got you now into the departure lounge, and now we're going to expose you to all the top brands that there are, mm. to all the best eating facilities and so forth. So the way it used to work out was the commercial revenue from airports was about 30% years ago, 60% operate, 60, 70% operational. It's now reversed. It's now yeah. 60, 60, 70% commercial revenue as opposed to 30%. 
And like I said at the beginning, what's happened there was IATA quite successfully um, pressurized airports to reduce their operating costs, which they have done, you know, for landing fees and ground handling fees and so forth. They've managed to do that. But of course, from the airport's point of view, they had to find a substitute for that loss of revenue. And that's where commercial has filled the gap. That's where it's filled the gap. And very successfully, I have to. And as you say, Changi is a case in point. Changi now has got to the point where not only do they see the facility of the airport as serving the uh, traveling public, they now develop the, their product to serve the inhabitants of Singapore as a shopping experience. So you can go to Chang, you can go to Changi Airport as if you were going to the supermarket. It just happens to be an airport. And that's what they're doing now. So it's a complete transformation from from where airports have, uh, where they've come from to, in a relatively short period of time, I have to say, you know, we think it was not, we're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, aviation is, is, is probably about a hundred years in the making anyway. So it's come a long way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, thinking about it even, you know, if I had an airport near me, which could serve as a shopping center, I would definitely go there because oh, sure. why not? You, you, yeah. you know, you see the kind of aircraft, uh, yeah. you know, behind you and it just, Kind of seems fun, I guess. But do you think it could go the other way then after some time? You know, like people's kind of needs change and maybe we'll reach that point where we say that it's it's overcomplicated. As you said, we like simplicity. Let's just kind of drop this whole idea and just come back to the simple, you know, runway and terminal. Yeah. Well, I think uh, from what I can see and, and from, you know, the, the sort of looking forward of like the futuristic uh, aspect of airports is that we're becoming now, airports are becoming uh, where you you do your own check-in, you do your own processing itself. You can do most of it, you can do it at home before you get to the airport. Mm -hmm. So there's that side of it as well. And the, what they're doing now at some airports is they're testing out a system now where your baggage, your baggage, and normally you, when you're leaving, you leave your home, take your bags with you, and then at the airport then deposit them. Well, to make it even simpler, why not have your baggage picked up at your home? And that's what's happening now. So you don't have to worry. You just pick your bags up at home. You sign the declaration, off your bags go. Next time you'll see your bags is when you get to your destination. So you, you don't have to worry about bags now. You don't have to worry about that. And also, I think the, um, the idea is, particularly in sort of like uh, Europe where land is not readily available there isn't that much land we're, we're not as fortunate as say as the middle east who mm. have got massive amount of uh, land to use for the development of airports because of the, the desert regions but i think the concept is now that the uh you've got this uh self-check-in at, at home you have potentially the baggage which will be taken off you and all you do now is get yourself to a reporting facility and then the reporting facility you'll literally board a train and the train will then whiz you off to some remote location where the airport is because in europe the land isn't available within the immediate vicinity of the existing airports so take so this sort of concept is is something which is being uh, looked at where you within your, your airport could be 30, 40, 50 miles away, but in a high speed train, it might only be like 20 minutes or so. So that's, that's been uh, certainly looked at. And then also now we've got the side, uh, the other aspect of this sort of airport city concept mm. where they build the airport and then they build the airport around, sorry, they build the infrastructure around the airport. So, you know, any industrial aspects, any commercial activities is feeding into the airport itself. And airports themselves are great, uh, they, they provide a great percentage of the GDP to countries. You know, there, there's a lot of money that comes through that is generated by uh, by airports themselves, not only in terms of uh, the travel aspect of it, but the things like, you know, the, uh, the tax revenue on, mm -hmm. on, on uh, cargo goods and so forth, it's, it's colossal. And we're talking about billions of, billions of, pounds or billions of dollars that's that's the sort of money the airports generate 
but they do cost a lot to build. That's the other side of it as well. And what we're seeing now is that, you know, countries will be faced with a bit of a, a dilemma where, well, we've got so much money, do we build an airport or do we build uh, two or three hospitals? You know, what is it you want? So the tendency now is that the, 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 the governments will build the hospitals, the airports might go out to private enterprise, private development. So the, they end up with the best of both. They don't necessarily own the airport, they haven't put, had to put the money out to build it, but they've got the benefit of, of, of the airport and new airport. And then, like you said right at the beginning, the airports nowadays are iconic images. They are an iconic image of how people who are traveling to the country perceive the country. They come to this airport, this, this gleaming, airport this terminal that's super efficient simple and easy and whatever and that is in their mind that is in their mind. and that then they take out into the the country itself yeah and i guess like way. first impressions count oh it's incredible like, a, like an image yeah without a doubt without a doubt, the airport is is very significant in that sense uh, mm -hmm. and that's why it'd be so easy to build airports that look like boxes you could build you could build a an airport that looks like a, a cargo terminal. You know, just need to process it. You just have the divisions within the building, that's fine. Is that really the image that uh, countries want? And it, the answer is no. Yeah. E even though they might, the airlines themselves may not be in favor of the amount of money it's cost to build. But if an airline is, is operating the latest aircraft, it wants to be operating to the best terminal. It's all part of the experience, isn't it? It's all yeah, part of this absolutely. image. And aviation is like that. Image, aviation is very much an, an image aspect to it. I see. And talking about experiences, now if we're coming back to passengers, you've already mm. also touched upon that. You know, uh, automatization kind of is becoming very common in airports. Like not long ago, we used to have to go through you know, people checking our passports and now you can just scan it, especially in, within the EU. Uh, do you think there's going to be like a minimal need for airport staff? Is it going to be all automized or is just just like a little uh, kind of part of the airport experience that is going to be like that? Yeah, well, it, as a rule of thumb, in, in, in my early days, as a rule of thumb, it used to work out that uh, for every million passengers, you'd, you would have a thousand employees. That was a ratio, thousand employees, okay. million passengers. What I have seen is figures that suggest now that that figure is more like 750, 800 employees, because clearly the baggage drop-off area themselves has changed things. Now the baggage drop-off has not only changed it from uh, uh, a staff requirement point of view, you don't need, so gone are the days when you had uh, you know, you're checking uh, islands as such, 16, normally made up of 32 deaths, 16 one side, 16 the other side. And depending on the size of the airport, you might have three, four, five um, islands of check desks. And at each check desk, there was a person. Mm -hmm. So when you think of 32, you know, 32 check desks, it was 32 people. Plus there was people helping with the bags and so forth. So. What, uh, certainly in, in terms of Singapore, it, it going to this uh, automated self-check-in actually helps them because they'd struggle to get the people, the employable people within Singapore, they had exhausted. So they couldn't get the people. So in a way it worked, it worked uh, to their benefit. And I think also people quite like the idea of doing, you know, their independency. They like the fact of, uh, now, that's a generation thing as well. We found that when we were putting in these common user self-service machines in India, mm -hmm. the generation, the younger generation, quite happy to use that, quite happy to put their passport in, get the ticket, put it on their bag and do fun. The older generation didn't quite like that because the old generation worked on the basis that if I have my bag and I give my bag to you, then I know it's safe because I've given it to someone. Whereas the other system is you just put it into the system. Mm -hmm. you know, it's gone. It's a bit like the internet, isn't it? You send off something on the internet, it's gone somewhere. And and that, so in terms of um, 
how you know airports are changing all the time. I think the way the uh, it will be in the future is they'll move to this chip. And I've been to some seminars where they've even, I mean, at the moment we put chips into animals. So the, the history, the inoculations of that animal that's going from one country is in the animal itself, it's in the chip. And I've been to one seminar where they talked about human chips. So the, the time will come, and it sounds far-fetched, but I, I don't disbelieve, the time will come where there'll be some sort of chip in your body, so you won't need a passport. You won't need any uh, documentation because it's all in the system, it's all there. Mm -hmm. Now, people say, well, that's, that's that's pie in the sky. I don't believe it is. I really I really don't. And I think the, the whole idea of this automation and even if before you get to that, the chip, but this sort of ticketless, paperless process is assisting airports in processing more passengers quickly. That you don't have the... You don't go to, you know, in my early days, you got to the uh, the check-in desk in the airport with a bunch of tickets and there was five coupons in each ticket and the, the check-in girl would check off your name, pull a coupon out, that coupon would go there, this coupon would go there. This The whole process was very much driven by paper. The whole, now it's less and less and less. In fact, there's, we get to the point now, you just have it on your mobile phone. Yeah. That's the way it's going. That's the way it's going to go, and and it's so easy, so simple. And the whole idea is to try and take the stress out of flying because it is quite a stressful process. It can be yeah. for it's, if you're a frequent flyer, then that's fine, isn't it? Because we all know what the airport is, and we feel comfortable, and we hear the, the, the signs, and we see all this, and we think that's fine. But for those who are not frequent flyers, maybe for those who are first time flyers, it's quite a it's quite an experience and time is is of the essence isn't it people are mm -hmm. conscious about not missing missing the flight you know everything is driven by time and when you get that such a situation in airports and that's where the safety comes in people forget what is what they're doing and they're rushing everywhere they're, and i've seen sadly i've seen you know where there's been many accidents as a result of that people just forget they mm -hmm. just focus on on this this time element so if we can address that and make it easy and simple and if you do it well then that's what opens the doors for repeat passengers that's when you get your passengers back because they know what the experience is they know how much time to allow they know where to go they feel comfortable there's no you know they've got to, and to support that going back to your original question you don't have the same uh, amount of people uh, in terms of the process is because it's automated now but what you do need is like customer service staff you know there'll always be those people who will still need some assistance you know who are a little bit mm -hmm. unsure or whatever and so you don't need the same amount of people but you do need some and one of the things i've seen at uh, many of the airports in the middle east is where people are coming into the terminal building is there are people there they've got sort of distinctive uh, t-shirts on that says something like, can I help you or whatever. So when people come in there, as soon as they need any information straight away, there's someone at the front door. Directions, where do I go for this? Where do I go for this? You know, that type of, I suppose you're trying to look at this sort of myriad of, uh, of uh, direction signs. You speak to someone mm -hmm. and say, where, where do I go and check in for this airline? They say, down there, turn left, and that's fine. And that makes it so much simpler as well. So it's, there's many ways of doing it. and. And uh, so substituting those previous roles to um, to one of more customer service orientated. And the other side is, of course, that the need for uh, this baggage drop area now will change the design of the infrastructure. Because mm. no longer do we need these big islands of check-in desks. We just need a place where I can go and take my bag. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, uh, the check-in areas for self-bank drop now are linear. It's just a big line of like one line of, of a baggage belt for for want of a better description and you go up to the machine put your bag in finish easy takes about a minute that's that's mm -hmm. amsterdam did a lot of work on that it takes them about 50 to 60 seconds to process your bag Whew. easy yeah when you think about it you know 
Yeah, and I guess you know, like a good experience equals client retention in a way. Like oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, choose the same airport. Yeah, travel. Yeah. To, yeah, and that's where airports need to be conscious of that. Now, it's different if you're an airport, if you're a monopoly airport, mm -hmm. where the passengers don't have any uh, alternative. Then, you know, sometimes. You could say, well, that's good, but on uh, on the other side, it, it could be bad as well because, well, if you don't, you know, you could you could adopt an attitude where if you don't like it, well, what are you going to do? You can't do anything, can you? So it's better to it's when you have this more competitive edge. I think it's uh, it's what airports need, and it keeps everybody on their toes, if you like, because if you have a bad experience at the airport, you will undoubtedly tell ten other people in some sort of form of conversation and that 10 other people now tell another 10 yeah. so before you know where you are you're into 100 so we've got to be we've got to be mindful of the passenger experience and uh, and and how we deal with the passenger and you know making sure that uh, everything is in place making sure that uh, it's easy making sure that when we're p dealing with people with uh, reduced mobility that we do it in the, in the proper way very independent people making sure that when we're dealing with transfer passengers that we have the right product there a lot of airports uh, in the middle east are transiting airports or transfer airports abu dhabi where i used to work you know the best part of uh, out of something like 22 million 18 million were transfer passengers so you have a bad experience as a transfer passenger so you get it wrong transfer passengers can be with you one day and gone the next day because then just choose another airport. Mm -hmm. It's as easy as that. You just have a bad experience. And you just think, well, next time I book my flight, I'll just go via another airport. So that's the way it is with, with airports. You have to be very mindful of that. And transfer passengers and things like minimum connection time, you've got to make sure you've got it right. There's nothing worse than passengers meeting the aircraft and they get to the destination, but there's no baggage. Mm -hmm. doesn't go down too well nope. not good not a good tick in the box that one yeah. i see yeah i think we've covered so many things uh, it's yeah. just getting more and more interesting i think i've got so many follow-up questions but i think we're running out of time but i do want to ask you is there a specific uh, airport that comes to your mind uh, as an example of excellence you know something that other airports should try to be let's say well, it's. It, I always think it's difficult to maybe pinpoint one. I mean, I've been. To, I have to say, I've been. To, I must have been to all of them, all of the airports. I mean, for those people who haven't been to the Middle East, you, you really have to see what they're producing there. Mm -hmm. It is. It is unbelievable. It is colossal. Uh, they are terrific airports themselves. So there's there's that side to it. Now. Just because you have a nice iconic airport doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to be good because there's two sides to it, isn't it? There's the infrastructure, mm -hmm. like we said before, but you've got to have the right people. We've got to train the people. We've got to know people need to understand why they're there. Um, and they're there to serve the passengers itself. So there's probably about, I, I think it'd be fair to say, three or four that really stick in my mind. I mean, obviously, I, I spent a lot of time at Changi Airport because mm -hmm. I lived there and so forth. And I used to fly out of there maybe every week. Hong Kong Airport is is, is a good airport. Now, Hong Kong Airport is, uh, they've just gone through a, a, a major development as well. But I always found that when I was dealing with Hong Kong uh, Airport Management, they were very receptive. They, they, they don't have blinkers on because of who they are and the size of their airport. They're always willing to to listen to you, and I always found that was a good aspect of of Hong Kong Airport. Um, you know, Seoul Airport is one of the classics as well, Kuala Lumpur. But if you come to the Middle East now, you've got uh, I mean, there's the Dubai, you'll have the, the Abu Dhabi. You've got Hamad Airport, this new one that's just uh, just received the Best World Airport Award. Mm over and above Singapore. So things are changing, things are changing. And when you go to these airports, it, they're just, well, when you, I, to give you an idea of the size, they've got a train system. They've got a, an air, airport people mover system inside the terminal building. 
That's how wow. big it is. That's how big it inside the building, not on the outside the airport. Yeah. Outside of the terminal building, it's going from one inside the building. This is just to get you from one end of the pier to the other end. It is just <laughs> beyond belief, beyond mm. belief. But the good thing is, I think we, I did a did some work. Um, a couple of months ago for one of the local universities here on their travel and tourism. And there are, um, I think something like 40 new airports under construction globally. There's probably about 80 and 90 airports under major expansion at the moment as well, globally as well. But one of the primary areas, well, it's probably two that it sits, but the, the main one is uh, the Far East. Mm -hmm. They're going through some colossal developments there because of the size of the population. You know, India, you take India and China combined, it's nearly two thirds of the world's population. You know, the airports are just, they have to be colossal. Beijing, you've got Beijing Capital Airport, mm -hmm. deals with about 100 million passengers a year. And you get Daging, which is just opened 150 million. So you've got two airports in one city serving 250 million people mind-blowing it is I, I can't even I, I i i don't think i've ever seen that kind of number <laughs> no i know well when i first started when i could go back to that first day uh th those first couple of years in airports at luton in so this would be in the in the 70s the year i think it was the second year the third year we reached a million passengers right a million pad we were euphoric we thought we okay. were a million passengers now we're talking about airports that deal with 250 million. So it puts okay. it into some sort of context, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, I think maybe there's someone, you know, watching this and then someone who will yeah. go see your course and maybe will be in charge of one of those expansions yeah. and, you know, kind I'm of sure. make those airports better. So thank you very much again for your time, Gordon. I really appreciate it. As mentioned, you can find Gordon's course in uh, our class website. You can explore it, you can learn with them. And then, yeah, I mean, in the future, we, we might get a chance to talk about more about airports, about, you know, management of them. And uh, even, you know, kind of cover all the other questions that I had today, but couldn't have the time for them. Yeah. Anyway, no, no. so thank you very much, Gordon, again. No, you're more than welcome. And I, I wish those who, uh, who view this get some form of inspiration from it. But it's a, it's a great industry and I, I could talk all day about it. I wouldn't, I can't, there's nothing to beat it. So best of luck to everyone.